<laughs> okay, so uh, who here is actually, do many of you use Unity day to day? Or? So uh, you've probably seen, uh, you press the uh, Windows key or the super, super modifier and it brings up the dash, uh, which is our primary, that, that, that's our, um, that's uh, the primary interface for uh, launching applications, finding files and everything. Uh, the scopes are the back-end code which drives the user interface. Uh, we've... Um, uh, the... Uh, sorry. Um, um, the... The API of the scopes has generally evolved over the years as the user interface has also up updated. We've, um, it follows, uh, we've got a design team who designs most of the UI and we basically try to follow that and design something which will uh, match that. So what I'm, I'm discussing, uh, I'll be describing now is what we've currently got and a, a bit of stuff about what we're doing in the future. Um, so we got there. So here's a bit of an overview of uh, some of the things which the dash will do. When you open it up, uh, you get some surfacing results, which um, I'll just show a picture of you. So this is just an example of when we open up the dash. Uh, can everyone, that's easy, easy can, you can see that, yep. Uh, so you've got the search box at the top, um, but uh, before you've entered anything in, there is some results which will come up by default. Uh, they come up in various, uh, they're displayed under a number of category labels. There is uh, the possibility to filter, out, uh, filter the results. And we've also got uh, some tabs at the bottom which let you drill down into particular types of results. Uh, as well as directly launching uh, results, it's also possible to bring up previews of, of the individual results. So I think when you, uh, when you do want to actually do a search, you start typing in, we provide incremental results. So if you've sort of typed half a word, you'll get some results. And as you keep on typing, it'll narrow it down to uh, your final, final result sets. Uh, the filters feature, it's, we provide different filters for different types of results. Uh, so for instance, if you're searching for, uh, uh, for files, you might be uh, filtering on types of files. If you're searching for music, you might be uh, uh, narrow it down to a particular genre or a particular range of decades when the, when the music was, was released. Okay, so uh, the result items on the, uh, which you get in, in Unity, the, they're basically a collection of, a, a dictionary of metadata. Uh, the very minim the minimal amount of information you've got is a URI we use to identify the result, a title and an icon, and which category it, it fits in. There's also a few other bits of pieces, but this is sort of the bare minimum that that we have for a result. And as well as some predefined values, we've also got, allow you to store arbitrary metadata, which um, is used for some other features. Um, so uh, the main the main uh, the main operation we perform on one of the scopes is a search. Uh, the surfacing mode I was talking about earlier, uh, we handle that as a search for the empty string. Um, so, for instance, if we've got uh, the searching for files, we might display a list of the recently used files. For um, uh, music, you might display um, highly rated music, which uh, the person's got, and etc. cetera. Um, the, the scope pushes the results through to the client, but as I was saying, 
since we're doing incremental results and scopes might be slow, the scope needs to sort of stop sending results when, when it's told to cancel a particular request because you type in half a word and it'll start searching, you finish off the sentence and you want to start the next search as soon as possible rather than waiting for, uh, for an old one to go through. Uh, activating results, uh, this is when you sort of double click on one of the results uh, the, the scope gets told to uh, ask to activate it and it can respond in a number of different ways. Uh, probably the most common one is just for the scope to say that it hasn't handled the activation, in which case uh, the shell is, does its best effort to activate the URI, so if it's a file it might have it, it'll try to open the associated application, if it's a directory it might open the file manager. If it's a web page, it'll open uh, the fa user's favorite uh, web browser. So that, that means that we don't really end up encoding some of this default behavior into each, each scope. If the, uh, if the scope does actually handle the, handle the activation itself, um, it can ask, for the, it can ask uh, the, uh, the shell to close the dash, or it can ask it to leave it open, which is there's uh, different reasons you might do that. Um, another one is it might, um, it might ask to open up a preview similar to what um, I, I showed earlier in some of the images. Or another one is it might ask the, the shell to perform another search. So we use that in some, in some cases. You might, rather than display, having a scope return a bunch of results, it might say if you're searching for Animals, it might say you want to look, here's some pictures of cats, uh, but rather than showing all of the cat pictures, it'll just have it give you an icon where when you click on that, it'll ask the dash to search for cats, cat pictures or something. So that's kind of useful. Um, I, I, oh, something happened with this, this side. Yeah. Uh, this, the, uh, the, the client can re request a preview by uh, passing one of the results back to the uh, back to the scope. So, and the scope uh, then provides, basically says that it wants to choose a particular uh, preview format and fills in the template with data. We uh, pass the entire result back to the scope uh, when pr producing one of the uh, uh, producing a preview. Uh, because that basically means that if there's information which, which the scope gathered when it was performing the search, you can stuff that into the result and it will be available when producing the preview, which can sort of speed things up a bit. Uh, as well as sort of a generic preview, we've also got previews which handle music, so you can have a playlist embedded in the preview and actually start playing some of the music or video ones, it, it'll actually let you start playing a video within, within the dash as well. And then there's ones for applications which have, I think, some ratings, um, ability to sort of store ratings and a few other things like that. But um, yeah, one of the other features is you can attach a number of action buttons um, in, in the preview which allow you to the scope to provide additional things other than the standard form of activation, and when you click on these, it'll the, the shell will send a request, an activation request back with the um, uh, with, with the ID of the particular action. So that's a good way of providing additional features. So I think an example is uh, the default action for in the file scope is just to open the files, but you might have ones to open an email and, and send it, or got similar things, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, one of the other thing, uh, the master scopes is uh, uh, the feature which handle, uh, I, I mentioned we have different categories of results controlled by some tabs at the bottom of the dash. Each of those is driven by a master scope. 
uh, rather than exposing each of the individual scopes um, to the user so they've got to pick which one they want to use, we have a smaller number of master scopes, which they're really just normal scopes, but rather than producing their own results, they will aggregate the results from some others. So when the, when the, sco when the, when the shell <coughs> issues a search to the master scope, it'll then send, send, uh, issue a, a search to other scopes, and then when the results come back, it'll aggregate them all together, maybe adjusting which categories they are in. It could modify them slightly and then dissuade them to the user. In general, you probably don't want to write a, a new master scope because A, it's more complicated than a simple scope, and B, um, the more master scopes we have, the, um, the more complex complexity it adds to the user interface. So we generally want people to sort of just have their scope fit into one of the existing categories if possible. Uh, so at the moment we've got the home scope, which, which is the default coming up on the dash, which will basically search everything. Uh, we've got the application scope, which will just launching applications and nothing else. We've got file scope, which will search files, uh, which is the content in the user's home directory and other stuff. So um, there, it, we've got a couple of scopes under the files. So I think if you've hooked up your Google account, uh, we can search Google Drive and return results from that um, alongside stuff for your local files. Then we've got, uh, there's the music scope, uh, which will take stuff from your local music library and also um, some cloud sources. So I like, think like we, we can pick some results from SoundCloud. And we've got a video scope, which again, takes local results and combines them with online stuff. So I think I think we've even got it set up so it'll uh, show you results from ABC iView, which will open it up in your web browser. Um, so we've got some region-specific uh, stuff for, for that. Uh, there's also a social scope, which I think uh, hooks into uh, the Friends application, sort of showing Facebook and Twitter stuff. But I don't know if we're sort of keeping that one, because we found the dedicated application generally does a better job for that. Uh, then we've got the smart scope server, which um, we don't, rather than running everything locally, uh, we have some scopes which are running on a server up, up, in, our, up in the data center, which uh, basically we use the same API for these, but rather than launching the, launching the scope applications locally and querying them, we have a bunch of them up on the server. and. We've got the ability to multiplex um, the searches, so we send a single single request up to the smart scope server, and it will then fan that out to all of the scopes which you which you're interested in, and take the results <coughs> and send them and, and aggregate them and send them back on the single connection. Uh, we uh, the smart scope server is only set suitable for um, anonymous results at the moment, so it'll provide. I mean, other than geolocation, it, it'll basically provide the same results to everyone. Um, we're basic, we do some geolocation, so like if we see you're in Australia, the online, online video scope will only provide you results. It, it'll provide you results for iView, but it won't give you BBC iPlayer and things like that, because basically we don't want to provide results which you can't actually look at. <laughs> um, but this also means that some other scopes which you might think of as being remote, like the Google Drive one, we can't use this infrastructure because that relies on user credentials, which we don't want to actually be storing, uh, storing remotely. At the moment, uh, most the results from the SmartScope server integrate with the home master scope directly. Uh, that's something which we're looking at changing, but um, yeah, that's, that's sort of something for the future. So uh, all of this scopes infrastructure, it, it grew out of uh, the Unity on the desktop. Um, but uh, a lot of the focus at 
at uh, Canonical recently has been on Ubuntu Touch. Uh, we're developing a, a phone and tablet operating phone and tablet operating system. Which um, oh, I just had another slide on the overview. This is just something from our, our our website, which is supposed to make the scopes stuff a bit easier to understand. But I don't know if it really does. <laughs> uh, yeah. That image was meant to be on this slide. <laughs> okay. So um, on on the phone, we've uh, been uh, we've got a new version of Unity Unity Eight, um, which is a new code base uh, which we've been. Uh, it's now based on uh, QML uh, rather than being based on top of Compiz, uh, but. The search, uh, the whole idea of having a search-based interface and surfacing and everything still fits into what we want to do. So, a lot of last year uh, we've spent was um, adapting all of the scopes infrastructure so that we could run it on the on these devices. So a lot of that was just adding a new client library which could talk to the scopes uh, from QML and basically. Just um, finding out which scopes uh, made sense to run on a phone and which ones didn't. But so that's a picture of of the uh, phone phone user interface, which probably looks somewhat familiar to anyone using the desktop version. Uh, we don't display the search bar by default, but if you click on the little search icon in the in the top in the top left, it'll open up a, it'll open up a search, and you can drill down just as you would on, on the desktop, but obviously means that uh, the surfacing modes are quite a bit more important on, on the phone because you don't, you generally don't, not going to be able to type so much, uh, typing is more difficult on, on these sort of devices, but yeah. Um, I had been planning on giving a bit more, getting a bit more technical details about this, but we've sort of been in the middle of rewriting of producing a new version of the Scopes API. So I have some sample code here, which is um, probably helpful if you're wanting to develop something on. Oh, actually, I had one other thing I was going to say. Sorry? Oh, sorry? Uh, you might be about to cover it, so uh, it's about the Python thing. Oh, I did mention Python on that slide. Yeah, that's what I was going to. Yeah. So the other, the other, the other issue, uh, problems we've been finding on the phone is we're generally resource constrained. Um, so one of our, we've been pushing to try and get as much um, scope, as many scopes as we can to run remotely uh, where possible. So this is generally stuff which doesn't need to touch local data or doesn't need, and doesn't need credentials. So we have some stuff which was running locally, which we're going to try and run remotely. And we're discouraging use of Python for local scopes, um, mainly because uh, the there's a it take uh, the, the interpreter takes a fair bit of memory, and if we do sort of try to shut down the scopes while we're not using them, it can take a while to start up. But we're still heavily using Python on on the uh, on the remote end, so it's kind of a bit of a juggling act. But we we still want to. Uh, we sort of still realize that we need to pro provide e easy to use languages for writing some of these things. So, is that now like C or something? Sorry? What is it now on the phone? Uh, we've got, well, sorry, I'm sorry, Trent was just asking what uh, interfaces we've got on the phone. So, with the current API, which we rolled out in 1310, it is a C API with bindings for Python and I think uh, I think everything it's I think everything we've been writing is in C or or Python. With the new API, it is a C plus plus one, and we're still it's still in flux a bit, but uh, we are providing bindings for that. Yeah. Okay. So even though I said we're uh, we've been discouraging Python, I've got some sample code in Python. <laughs> 
I sort of kind of hoped that our new API would be nailed down enough that I could include some stuff about this, but I think there's various bits missing, uh, which we're still sort of in the process of fleshing out in the API. So I, it seemed like the lesser of two evils to talk about this. So um, the main things in the scope is it provides the list of categories, which those are the uh, labels you get at the top of the results. Uh, you get just giving an ordered list of categories. Uh, then you've got methods which um, provide a ask the scope to produce a search object uh, when when a query comes in, and one for uh, creating a pre uh, a similar thing for creating a previewer object and a method to activate a result. Um, the search object um, has a run method. Uh, it'll, it'll execute the search in a separate thread. So that's one of the search object, uh, search class is basically just there to manage an individual request um, and manage the, the, the worker thread which, where it's executed. So again, we can take the, we get a qu the uh, search query and then we've got a result set object we can push the results into. And the other thing is that it, uh, the search is also provided with a cancellation object. Um, you can either query it directly or various, a if you've got an API which uh, can, you, you can either, uh, uh, which can do asynchronous um, notification, uh, you can, you can use it to sort of cancel like glib networking stuff or other stuff like that. So in general, if you're doing network access, you probably want to um, uh, make, make sure you use the cancellation stuff so that your scope stays responsive as, as users type. Uh, this, is, this was all looking great a second ago. Okay, so something's happened when I just went to, uh, to change the monitor resolution, so. Okay, um, the previewer is similar. Uh, the previewer sort of pro provides a similar, um, um, similar thing. It runs in its own thread so that uh, you can uh, perform asynchronous calls without blocking other other uh, threads and I mean, other other requests coming in, and um, it, it can add act actions onto the uh, it can add actions to the preview, which will then go via the activation API. Um, uh, and then lastly, there's some scope configuration uh, configuration. Uh, file which is used to locate all of the scopes on the system. Uh, we dump them in a subdirectory which um, is used to link it up to one of the existing master scopes. Uh, there's also some additional metadata in, in the configuration file which tells you about things like whether the scope is uh, uh, touches remote content. So. We use this so that we can permanently disable any scopes if the user has decided that they don't want any remote content coming up on on, on the on the dash, rather than having to have each scope check this configuration variable itself. Okay. So, uh, yep, Trent. Um, I saw. Uh, so I see you adding the action to open. That's the really obvious one. Yep. I saw you mentioned previews before about music and video. Is that functionality built into Unity? Do you sort of tell it where to get the source, or do you have to somehow implement that player yourself? So, yeah. With the, the music preview where you can attach a list of a, a list of uh, of tracks as a playlist. You sort of provide basic metadata about them, like the track title and a URI. The dash will then try to play the. Uh, play the song itself. So, if it's a file URI, it, it basically just it'll be going via GStreamer or the Media Hub on the on the phone. So that's so, built in. Yeah, 
Um, and there's a similar one for the video preview. Is there any ability to do some kind of custom UI for something that doesn't fit into the model yet? Um, at the moment, it's, you've got to fit into one of the templates. Um, uh, you, we've got the generic, uh, you've got some free text area, but it's fairly limited at the moment. Um, basically, we partly we're just doing that because it was done that way to try and give some commonality between all of the scopes, and partly because um, we partly because uh, some of the uh, more complicated things people might want to do, we've sort of tried to sort of match a few of the use cases, but uh, can't really handle everything. But we're probably looking at changing that in the future, but yeah. Thanks. So uh, the future for a lot of the API has been, we've been looking at uh, producing a new C++11 API, mainly because a lot of the rest of Unity is built on C++, and we sort of do realize that it's not the best language um, uh, for getting lots of contributors. I mean, I th we really benefited a lot from having Python available for um, it, the on the desktop because we've had a couple of people who have just developed a huge number of scopes. Uh, uh, we had a hundred scopes project. We didn't quite make it that high, but. Uh, Basically, you want to have something which is easy for a developer, to, uh, someone who wants to scratch their itch. So we don't want to lose that with the new API. So um, first up, we've been looking at targeting Go and JavaScript as as the first languages we're going to provide bindings for. Just JavaScript is fairly lightweight, which is good on the phone, and it's got there is a lot of people who know it. Go, we've sort of found. Shares a lot of um, a lot of people who like Python like like Go. I, I like Go and I like Python, um, and so that's one of the things I've I've been focusing on recently. And but the other ha hope is that if we can provide those two language bindings, the new API we've got should be easy to bind for anyone else who is interested in other languages. But yeah, um, one of the other other um, areas which we've been looking at is application confinement. Um, this is sort of one of the big pushes we've got on Ubuntu Touch, where rather than having a member of the Ubuntu project review every new application which goes into the system and package it up with Debian packaging and, uh, and push it out and six monthly releases, we want to have let developers pretty much release their application and have it available instantly. And, you can really only do that if you don't if you don't have to pr provide place quite as much trust in an application because a desktop application can pretty much once it's installed it can do anything it could email your contacts to Russia if it wanted to but so we're looking at app armor to limit what an application can do and keep it from interfering with other applications but we didn't quite make make that for the um, get that far from the scopes. So in 13.10, the scopes run as privileged applications, but we want to change that. And again, one of the, one of the things we want to, want to hit with that is, is allowing thing, making sure that, say, a scope which touches the network, like the Google Drive one, won't be able to read your personal data locally, or alternatively, having a scope that does touch your local data won't be able to then send uh, uh, send it out out to the world, and some of this gets more complicated than we'd like. Like the uh, if we've got aggregating scopes, you want you don't want to have all the scopes talking to each other. You want to limit what which scopes can actually aggregate from who, because then you might sort of have you might. Have, have an attacker wanting to produce three scopes, one of them which reads your lo local data and returns it, an aggregating scope which reads that data and then sends it as searches to something which can access the network to get it out. So we're trying to sort of uh, limit, uh, limit the damage which a scope could do so that people, it'll, 
people can sort of feel somewhat confident that when they install a scope, it's going to do what it says it does and nothing more. So that's still a work in progress, but um, the new API is designed to sort of make this a bit easier. And yeah, so. So we've got some of, uh, there is some aspects of that. So we are using App Armor for this. Um, I don't know if we would be doing network access as a, as a I think that one might be something which is always on or off when you install an application, but um, generally most of the applications are going to be fairly locked down. And if you want to do, if you want to access um, things like contacts and stuff, it's going to be through a trusted helper. So uh, the application won't have direct access to the data, but can request it, the access. And that, that request will be allowed by App Armor, but the trusted helper will implement a policy to decide whether to allow things. So that does let, let us do just-in-time requests for, for access. But I don't think that's all, all in place yet. But yeah. Um, so we've got a, a few we've got a few resources for the current scopes API, which you can use for developing on thirteen ten. There's there's an overview which um, provides uh, most most of this um, most of this data, and a, there's a tutorial which will tell you a bit about programming the current API in C. Uh, if you want to, if you're interested in the new API, which is still in flux, I think the best option at the moment is to check out the source code, which you can just branch it with Bazaar using that uh, thing. So that's um, that's uh, most of what I've got. Uh, if people have, uh, uh, is there any questions? Uh, yes. Um, so you could just kind of restate. Any other questions? Um, uh, Trent? <laughs> I'm trying, just trying to figure out how to articulate the question. Um, with the, the scopes and, and with App Armor, um, but also around, I guess, the privacy stuff, is, is there anything where you're trying to have some tracking, but maybe not to the user. Like, I guess good examples are online stores might like some kind of context and that sort of thing. I'm not sure if you're including any of those in these scopes or not. It's, um, right, so yeah, the question so like, is... Is there any info surrounding sending some kind of user data specific to that scope maybe, rather than the actual yeah. user or something? Okay, uh, so the question is sort of about whether we provide, what user data we would provide to a scope. Um, I think for a remote, uh, for a remote scope, we've, basically limiting it to geographic information. I think we might sort of, we do, we do send the carry, uh, information about carrier, if it's a phone, to the remote end. I don't, I don't think we pass that on to the scopes at the moment. But again, uh, for a local scope, then they might be able to, I, I don't really know exactly what, which identifiers they'd be able to get. Um, I think you'd probably, a scope would probably be able to create an identifier, a, a local one would probably be able to create an identifier if it really wanted to, um, a random identifier, I'd, yeah, if it wanted to uh, uh, correlate results, but I don't think we directly provide, um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, is it correct the benefit of writing scopes is to add search I'm sorry, could you repeat the end of that? Sorry. Uh, is it correct that the benefit of writing scopes is to add search results from sources that would otherwise be available? Yeah, so question. All right. Um, 
So the question is whether we, you'd, you'd write a scope in order to make for results which aren't otherwise available. Yeah, yeah generally we've, we've sort of, it's, if they're not otherwise, if they're already available in, in the dash, then you probably wouldn't want to rewrite to uh, replace that. But I think probably the um, more interesting scopes are ones which sort of target a particular specific domain of data and provide that. So like, um, I know we've got, uh, in, in music, you might have some particular website. Say you've got a website you really like, who has a whole lot of drum and bass music, you might sort of write a scope particularly for that website. And then if the user installs the scope or enables it, then they can have those results uh, coming up alongside uh, the music they've got locally. And, uh, yes? Are you planning to um, encourage service providers to supply scopes and to write scopes for their services? Uh, yes, so the question is whether we're encouraging service providers to write their own scopes. Um, yes, uh, we don't really want to be in a position of writing every, every scope uh, on the system. We basically, at uh, the Unity team, we've We've basically been providing a set of base scopes, but we obviously can't handle everything, and uh, we sort of want to provide a, an a, a clean API which other people can hook into the system, so that they don't need to ask our permission to uh, to extend the system. So yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, so, so it's uh, the Unity Scopes API project on, on Launchpad. Um, yep. uh, there's, I think it's also getting built into the Unity Daily Build PPA, but I, and I think occasionally there's pushing, it, it's also available in, in the development version of Ubuntu, but uh, the pushes to, to Ubuntu sort of come after all of the testing, uh, integration testing of everything. So given how fast things are developing at the moment, I would suggest going straight to the source code uh, rather than pulling it from Ubuntu uh, directly. Uh, yeah. right. Any further questions? Cool. Thank you very much, right. James.